Ah, uh, what's up, LG bros and broettes? We're doing math on the internet, so don't adjust your TV sets. Let's get linear. Hey, today we're going to take a look at inner products, also known as dot products, if you like that term as well, and more discussion on vectors. So we have here, let u be a column vector with n entries, let v be a column vector with n entries, so here u has entries, u sub 1, u sub 2, so on and so forth, to u sub n, v has entries, v sub 1, v sub 2, so on and so forth, to v sub n. The inner product of u and v is given by u dot v, which here, we'll define this in terms of linear algebra in a second, but here, what I would end up doing is I would take these vectors, I would multiply corresponding components, so u1 times v1, u2 times v2, so on and so forth, u sub n times v sub n, and then I would add those products together. So if I want to think about this in terms of matrices, linear algebra, we would say u transpose times vector v. So it's really u transpose times vector v, but we're interested more in the results. And the result of this type of multiplication of a vector times a vector gives us a scalar. So we're going to see this gives us a scalar, a number. So we have a theorem. Let u, v, and w be vectors in vector space Rn. Give them the lats. And let c be a scalar. We have the following properties. u dot v is the same as v dot u. So here it doesn't matter the order that we dot them. If I dot two vectors, the result will be the same. Uh, so we have a nice commutative property there. If I have a sum u plus v and then dotted with vector w, I have this nice right distributive law that would be u dot w plus v dot w. Here if I have scalar c times vector u and then dotted with vector v, I could bring the scalar all the way out and then take a look at dotting the vectors together, u dot v. Or if for some reason it's advantageous to do this, I could bring that scalar in to scale vector v and then do u dotted with c times vector v. And remember, u and v are vectors, c is a number, c is a scalar, c is a number. And then here we have u dotted with itself, u dot u, is going to be non-negative. So we'd say that it's greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, the only time that it's gonna give me zero is if the vector u is the zero vector, the zero vector. Because if I dot a vector with itself, that means I'm gonna be multiplying corresponding entries and adding those products. If I multiply a positive number times itself, it's going to give me a positive number. If I multiply a negative number times itself, it's going to give me a positive number. And the only way I'm going to get a sum of all zeros is if, uh, if, as if I'm just working with zero entries exclusively. Hopefully that makes sense. And then we have a definition, <clears throat> the length, or sometimes we refer to it as the norm, or maybe you heard, heard of it as the magnitude, but the length or norm or magnitude of a vector v is the non-negative scalar, and here we use a double bar notation, double bar v, defined by, and here the magnitude or length or norm of vector v, is the square root of v dotted with v, or we can think of this as the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared plus so on and so forth plus v sub n squared. Where here we would say the magnitude of vector v squared, if I were to square this idea, it would just be v dotted with v. We can see here that if, uh, you know, if I square this square root, then it's going to just leave me with v dot v. Now, if I have a scalar, so here, remember, v is a vector and c is a scalar, and I would go in there and give it a little vector head notation, but I don't want to kind of, there's not a lot of space to work in. But if I want the magnitude of c times vector v, then I can just focus on the magnitude of v, so I have double bars around v, times the absolute value of c. So let me write it down here so we can see it a bit better. So double bar c times vector v is going to be absolute value of c times the magnitude of vector v is what we're saying here. So on the magnitude of c times vector v, I can bring c out, but I have to make sure I'm working with absolute value, and then magnitude of vector v. Let's take a look at some examples. Given the following three vectors, we'd like to find the following computations. Here are vector u, vector v, and vector w. And let's go ahead and let's go through the list. So here I want to find u dotted with itself. So u dotted with u. 
And when doing this, you know, if it helps, think about there being two of these vectors, right? You can sort of do it mentally, but if it's something that's sort of new, then I would write vector u twice out. It may seem kind of silly to do that. And then think about dotting the vector. What this means is I want to multiply corresponding entries and sum the product. So I want first entries multiplied, so that's negative 1 times negative 1. And then I add to this, then I want to multiply the second entries, which would be 2 times 2. So then this is going to give me 1 plus 4, and that's going to give me 5. Next, I want to find v dotted with u. And what's nice is I can actually look back here and I can see here's v and here's u. And remember we said earlier the order doesn't really matter. If I multiply the first entries, that would be 4 times negative 1. And then plus 6 times 2. And then find those products, so that's going to give me negative 4. And then plus 12, and that's going to give me 8. Now this next objective says, okay, we'll find v dot u divided by u dot u. And I actually have the pieces that I need for this, so I can just look at these previous answers. v dotted with u gave me 8, divided by u dotted with u gave me 5. And notice our dot products here give me scalars, dividing dot products, it's a number divided by a number, so it gives me a scalar as well. However, this next objective says 1 over w dot w times vector w. So that's going to be a bit different, right? 1 over w dot w times vector w means I'm going to be scaling. This is going to be a number, 1 over a constant, 1 over a number gives me a scalar, times vector w. So I'm scaling this vector. And how is it going to look? Well, I'm going to have 1 over, and then what is w dotted with itself? So I'm going to multiply, what do you think of it? sort of like squaring the entries, right? So here I'm going to have 3 times 3, multiply the entry by itself. I'll write it out at first, 3 times 3, plus second entries, negative 1 times negative 1. And remember we said you could write this vector out twice if it helps, negative 1 times negative 1. And then that last entry was a negative 5, so we want negative 5 times negative 5. And I want to scale that into vector w, which had entries 3, negative 1, negative 5. So this is the setup for this computation, but I want to go through and do the rest of the work. So this is going to be 1 over, here I'm going to have 9 plus 1 plus 25, scaling into that vector. So that's going to give me 1 over, 9 plus 1 is 10. 10 plus 25 gives me 35. And then I would say bring this in, scale the vector, give your answer as one vector, not a constant times a vector. We can do better. So that's going to give me 3 over 35, negative 1 over 35, negative 5. Oh, too many fraction bars. That's on me. And then negative 5 over 35. And then here it looks like I can simplify a bit. So let me make this a bit bigger since I learned my lesson. So first entry, I have 3 over 35. Negative 1 over 35 will not reduce. But this last one, negative 5 over 35, I can reduce. It's going to give me negative 1 over 7. And then this is that result. 1 over w dotted with itself. So 1 over w dot w times vector w. And this gives me a vector since I'm scaling a vector. Oh, and what else was there to do? By u dot v divided by v dot v times vector v. So u dot v over v dot v times vector v. And you can use the parentheses there. Now, I do already have u dot v, I believe. Or we found v dot u. Remember, v dot u is the same as u dot v, and that gave us 8. But I did not find v dotted with itself. And then what was vector v? Vector v was 4, 6. So eventually I'm going to be scaling vector v, which has entries 4, 6. And let's find v dotted with itself. So here, 
think four times four is gonna give me 16, plus six times six is gonna give me 36. And we can keep going with this, so that's gonna give me eight divided by, here if I add, we'll say six and six gives us 12, so I say two carry the one, one and three gives me a four, and then one gives me five, so 52. And then scaling into the vector for six, I can reduce this coefficient. I can reduce the top and the bottom by four. Four goes into eight twice, and four goes into 52 13 times. And then as a, a nice sort of final step, bring that scalar in. So I'll say, okay, four times two gives us eight over 13, and six times two gives me 12 over 13. And there's my final answer. And then almost done, now I want the magnitude of w. So the magnitude of vector w, remind me, the magnitude of vector w is going to be the square root of w dotted with itself. And I do actually have all the work for this, so I can kind of go back to where I computed w dot w before. Remember, that was in the denominator here, so just this denominator piece. We had 3 times 3 plus negative 1 times negative 1 plus negative 5 times negative 5. Give us 9 plus 1 plus 25. Give us 35. So this would just be the square root of 35 would be the magnitude or the length or the norm of vector w. So not so bad with that. And that was it. We did all the, we did all the things. Nice sort of exercises, getting comfortable with dot products. Oh, we have a nice de definition here. So here for vectors u and v in vector space Rn, the distance between vectors u and v, written as dist, comma, uh, dist parentheses u comma v, is the length of the vector u minus v, that is the distance between u and v, is the magnitude of the vector u minus v. So I find the difference between the two vectors and then I find the magnitude of that new vector. And another important topic for this section is unit vectors. A unit vector is a vector whose length is one. For instance, if you're familiar with Calc 3, i, j, and k are all unit vectors. And that would be working in three space in R3. So we call this sort of E1, E2, and E3 where E1 is the vector 1, 0, 0, we call this I, but then J, vector J is 0, 1, 0, or E2 we call it in this course, and then E3 would be K, or the vector 0, 0, 1 in R3. So these are common examples of unit vectors. You use them a lot in Calc 3. If you haven't taken Calc 3 yet, you should take Calc 3. But in general, if a vector V does not equal the zero vector, very important that I don't have the zero vector to start, then the unit vector that has the same direction as vector v, but is now a unit vector, is u, u for unit vector, is one over the magnitude of vector v times vector v, or that's simply just written as the vector v divided by its length. So I take the vector and I just divide it by its length, and that will give me a unit vector in the same direction. So for example, if I want to find a unit vector in the direction of the following given vector, then here I can go ahead and start by finding the length of the vector, the magnitude of this vector. Let me name this vector something like a. The magnitude of vector a is going to be the square root of, here I want the dot product of the vector with itself. So think about that sort of like squaring the entries and adding the sums, so adding the products, sorry, summing the products. So negative 30 times negative 30, and then plus 40 times 40, and it's gotta be under that square root to make it a, a magnitude or a length or a norm. And I'll say, what is this gonna give me? Well, it's gonna give me the square root of, negative times negative is positive, this is gonna give me 900, plus, and then here I'm gonna get 1600. We're adding under the square root, that's gonna give me square root of 2500, and I can take the square root of this, right? So the square root of 25 gives me five, square root of 100 gives me 10, so that's gonna give me 50. And that's the length of this vector. But now to make this into a unit vector, 
the unit vector is going to be one over the length of the vector, so one over 50, scaled into the vector. And then we just go and we divide each entry by the length of the vector. So that's going to give me negative 30 divided by 50 for the first entry, 40 divided by 50 for the second entry. And this is going to reduce nicely, right? So here I get negative 3 fifths and then 4 fifths. And that's my unit vector in the same direction as this given vector. And unit vector means the length of this vector is 1. So if I found the magnitude or the length or the norm of this vector, well, this would give me that the length is 1. Let's go ahead and take a look at another example. Find a unit vector in the direction of the following vector. Let's name this vector v. The first thing I want to do is I want to find the length of this vector v. Now, if the length is already 1, then we don't have to do anything, and the vector is its own unit vector. But it looks like it probably won't be the case, so let's go ahead and find what the length of it currently is. And I want to square these entries and then sum the squares. I'm going to rewrite them a bit though. 7 fourths is fine. I'm going to leave that as 7 fourths. I'm going to square it. Instead of leaving this as a 1 half, I'm just going to write it to higher terms. So 1 half is the same as 2 over 4. Let me write it as 2 over 4 instead and then square that. It's going to be the same thing, right? Just bring it to higher terms. And then 1, I'm getting a common denominator if you haven't noticed. I'm going to write that as 4 over 4. And I'm going to square that. Now this is going to be nice for the arithmetic under the square root. And we'll see that in just a bit because now I'm going to have square root of here 7 over 4. If I square it, 7 over 4 times 7 over 4 gives me 49 over 16. 2 over 4 times 2 over 4 gives me 4 over 16. And then 4 over 4 times 4 over 4 is going to give me 16 over 16. And the reason why this is nice is now I have like fractions already. If I didn't do that before, I could go ahead and do it now, but I already have the common denominator, so I'm sort of a step ahead, right? And I can write this all as one fraction. So here, if I add the numerators, I'm going to have 49 plus 4 plus 16, and then all divided by 16. And then let's go ahead and see if we can sum. So here, um, I would do this. I would say, let me take a 1 from the 16. 49 plus 1 is 50. So then 50 plus 15 is going to give me um, 65 plus 4 gives me 69 over 16. And now I can use the quotient property of the radical. Now the quotient property of the radical says square root of a divided by b is the same as square root of a divided by square root of b. And this is good because I can write this as square root of 69 divided by square root of 16. And the square root of 16 is 4, so square root of 69 divided by 4. And that's going to be the length of this vector. Now what I want to do is I want to scale this vector by 1 over the length. So I want 1 over radical 69 over 4 scaled into this vector. And I'm just going to use the original vector. I don't need that common denominator anymore, I don't think. Now scaling here, since my magnitude is a fraction, instead of 1 over this fraction, I'm going to flip it. So that's going to be 4 divided by radical 69, and then scaled into the vector. That vector has entries 7 fourths, 1 half, and 1. And then bring that scalar in. And think about how it's going to um, simplify with what's already there. So here, when I bring the 4 over radical 69 in, the 4s are going to cancel. So I have 7 over radical 69. I hear 4 divided by 2 is going to give me 2 over radical 69. And then here, just multiplying it into this 1 is going to give me just 4 over radical 69. And this is my unit vector. Now, if I took a look at what the length of this vector is, the length is going to be 1 since it's a unit vector. And I think it's fine to leave the vector like this. If you want to rationalize, if you don't like square roots in the denominator, or if somebody told you that that's bad, or you should never do that, then you could certainly rationalize. You would just multiply by radical 69 over radical 69. 
through all of the entries, and then get rid of those square roots in the denominator that way, if you fancy that. Let's take a look at the following. Find the distance between the two vectors. Now, remember what we said we have to do to find this. The first thing I need to do is find the difference of the two vectors, and the order doesn't really matter. I'm just going to do x minus y. And then I can find the magnitude or the length or the norm of that new vector. So if I find vector x minus y, and here I'm just going to be subtracting the vectors, so 10, negative 3, and then minus negative 1, negative 5. And you could do the length of y minus x would be the same, but I think it's fine just to go in this direction. This gives me a new vector, 10 minus negative 1, that's 10 plus 1, gives me 11. Negative 3 minus negative 5, that's negative 3 plus 5, gives me 2. And this is the new vector given by x minus y. Now I want the magnitude or the length or the norm of vector x minus y. <clears throat> so I can go ahead and find that, right? So here I want the square root of, and then I want to square the entries. So I think 11 times 11, and then add the squares, 2 times 2. Let's see what this gives us. So here I get the square root of 121 plus 4 or that's the square root of 125. And I can do better with this because I can factor a 25 out. So it's gonna be square root of 25 times five. And we have a really nice product property of the radical, very similar to our quotient property that we saw earlier. Square root of a times b is the same as square root of a times square root of b. So here, if I break this up, I can say square root of 25 times square root of 5. Just a, a word of warning, we don't have any nice properties for sums, but we do have ones for quotients and products. So we have one for quotients earlier, products now, don't do anything with, with adding. A square root of 25 gives me 5 times the square root of 5. And that's very nice. And this is going to be the distance between the two vectors. So the distance between vector x and y you can think of it as the length or the norm or the magnitude of the vector x minus y. That distance is 5 times square root of 5. So not too bad. I'm going to take a look at just a couple more ideas for this section. We have two vectors u and v in vector space rn are orthogonal to each other if their dot product is 0. So that's if u, time, if u dot v is 0 or their inner product is 0. And we're going to talk a lot more about this idea in the next section. But let's just sort of build these mechanics for the lecture. And I want to determine if the following pairs of vectors are orthogonal. And first we'll take a look at vector a with entries 8, negative 5, and vector b with entries negative 2, negative 3. So let's find the dot product, a dot b. Here I'm going to multiply corresponding entries. So first entries, 8 times negative 2, and then add to this. Second entries, negative 5 times negative 3. And this is going to give me negative 16 plus 15, which gives me negative 1. Now this isn't 0, however, negative 1 is close to 0. And we have a very nice theorem that says if the dot product is close to 0, then... I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. There's no theorem. If it's not 0, it's not 0. Know what I mean? Let me say, put it in the comment section below. Say, hashtag, if it's not 0, it's not 0. Make it a hashtag. If it, if it ain't zero, it ain't zero. If it's not zero, don't try to be a hero. If it's not zero, then it's something other than, than zero. It has to be zero. So it's not zero. That's what I care about. We will say since a dot b does not equal zero, this means a and a and b are not. orthogonal. And orthogonal is sort of an interesting word. I think a, another term we could use that might be a little bit more familiar to some of us is perpendicular. So a and b are not perpendicular vectors. Let's take a look at one more example. Here are vectors u and v. Are they orthogonal? Are they not orthogonal? We have to find their inner product, their dot product. So multiplying the first entries, 
3 times negative 4, and then add to this. Second entries, 2 times 1, and then add to this. Third entries, negative 5 times negative 2, and then add to this. Fourth entries, 0 times 6. And this is going to give me negative 12 plus 2 plus 10 plus 0. Let's go ahead and add them up. So here, you know, 10 and 2 give me 12, minus 12 gives me 0. And this is what I need, right? Two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is 0. So we can say since u dotted with v gave us 0, that means vectors u and v are orthogonal. A little smiley face. It's good. We like that. It's kind of a messed up looking smiley face, but we'll, don't judge me. Just some notes here. Orthogonal means perpendicular, or if you want to think about it geometrically. We have a nice theorem, a Pythagorean theorem, and its adaptation to what we're doing with vectors. Two vectors u and v are orthogonal if and only if the magnitude of u plus v squared is equal to the magnitude of u squared plus the magnitude of v squared. And here referring to magnitude as either the length or the norm is fine. And one last thing that I want to discuss for this section is w perp. Yeah, it's very exciting to say w perp. You have to say it like that. So I want you to try, go ahead and pause the video. I don't care uh, if you're with your family or your roommates or if you're in a public space. Um, go ahead and just let out. It's very cathartic. Feels good to just say w perp. <laughs> w perp. W perp. Hey, and how. Let's talk about w perp. I have to tell you about w perp. A vector x is in w perp, perp for perpendicular, and we have this kind of looks like an upside down capital T, but it is to show that we mean perp for perpendicular. w perp. A vector x is in the, the vector subspace w perp if and only if vector x is orthogonal to every vector that is in a set that spans w. So this vector has to then, if it's going to be in w perp, then it has to be orthogonal to every vector in some spanning set for classic w. w perp is a subspace of vector space rn. And well, why is this important? Why do we care about this? Well, we're going to care about it later on in the chapter. But we can actually refer back to some interesting subspaces. Let A be an n by n matrix. The orthogonal complement of the row space A is the null space of A. And the orthogonal complement of the column space of A is the null space of A transpose. So the row space of A is an orthogonal complement to the null space of A. And the column space of A is an orthogonal complement to the null space of A transpose. And let's actually show this. What do we mean by this? Well, let's take a look at this matrix A. And let's just reduce and find these different subspaces, these familiar subspaces. So if I go and do a row replacement on row 2, replacing with row 2 minus twice row 1, I can rewrite row 1 to start. Here I get 2 minus 2 times 1 gives me 0. 6 minus 2 times 3 gives me 0. 10 minus 2 times 5 gives me 0. And I can see that I just have one pivot entry. So that means one pivot column. So my column space of A has a basis for column space of A. It's just going to be that first column vector, 1, 2. And column space of A should be an orthogonal complement to the null space of A transpose, so we'll find that later. I can also find a basis for the row space. Basis for the row space of A. So this is going to be a row vector since I only have one non, well, the, the first row is the only non zero row. That means that first row is going to be my row vector and my basis for the row space of A. So the row vector 1, 3, 5. And since this is already fully reduced, I can think about augmenting with the zero vector. And I could build from this, I could build from this, now a basis for the null space. And we see we have two free variables, so there should be two vectors in there. But that 
as an equation is saying x1 plus 3x2 plus 5x3 equals 0, and x2 and x3 are my free variables. So x sub 1 equals negative 3x sub 2 minus 5x sub 3. And if I build this out into a parametric vector description, we'll say x is equal to some numerical vector times x sub 2 plus some numerical vector times x sub 3. And x sub 1 is a negative 3x sub 2 minus 5x sub 3. And then just filling in for the free variables, x sub 2 is itself and x sub 3 is itself. And here I can see those two vectors that are going to live in a basis for my null space. So I can go here and say, okay, basis for the null space of A should be the set of two vectors. The vector is negative 3, 1, 0, and the vector negative 5, 0, 1. And then I just need to find a basis for the null space of A transpose. So I'll get ready for it. Now, to find a basis for the null space of A transpose, I literally have to work with A transpose. That would be A transpose times a vector x is equal to the zero vector. And matrix A, to start, was 1, 3, 5, 2, 6, 10 were the rows. And now I have to find A transpose. So remember, this means my first row is going to become my first column. So the first row, 1, 3, 5, becomes my first column in order 1, 3, 5. And my second row becomes my second column, 2, 6, 10. And now I can go ahead and reduce. I'm going to leave the first row alone, but I can replace row 2 with row 2 minus 3 times row 1. And I can replace row 3 with row 3 minus 5 times row 1. And you can see that this is going to give me rows of all zeros. And so that's reducing A transpose, but now I can think about, okay, I want the null space of this matrix. So I think about augmenting with the zero vector. And you can see, well, here I have one free variable x sub 2, where x sub 1 equals negative 2x sub 2 if I solve this. So then this is going to give me a vector. If I write a parametric vector description of it, I get x is equal to x sub 2 times the vector x sub 1 is negative 2x sub 2, and x sub 2 is itself. And I just have those two variables. So just x equals x sub 2 times the vector negative 2, 1. And I can go ahead and take this vector to build a basis for the null space of A transpose, so the vector negative 2, 1. Now we can prove this result, but I like to do this a bit more mechanically because now I can show you in an example that these are orthogonal complements, that the row space of A is an orthogonal complement to the null space of A, and that the column space of A is an orthogonal complement to the null space of A transpose. And I've tried to write these so they would sort of line up nicely vertically. So if I were to do a dot product of any vector in the column space of A against any vector in the null space of A transpose, and we do refer to this sometimes as the left null space, if you've heard it referred to as that. If I find the dot product of these, the dot product is going to give me zero. We can see pretty quickly one times negative two plus two times one is gonna give me negative two plus two gives me zero. So you can actually see that those spaces are orthogonal complements. And it is the same with the row space and the null space of A. That if I take any vector in the row space and any vector in the null space of A, that those vectors are going to be orthogonal, that their dot product is zero. And if I had more vectors in these bases, it would be true in any sort of combination and any pairing of them, but here I don't have too crazy of an example to sort of illustrate my point. But if I do the dot product of these as vectors, I'd get, you know, 1 times negative 3 plus 3 times positive 1 plus 5 times 0 is going to give me negative 3 plus 3 gives me 0. And then with this other vector, so if I want to switch over here and do this one instead, 1 times negative 5 plus 3 times 0 plus 5 times 1 it's going to give me negative 5 plus 0 plus 5 is going to give me 0. So these are orthogonal complements.
right? And that's a little bit about orthogonal complements and W perp. This is going to come back into play later on, which is why I want to address this idea of these orthogonal complements now, because we are going to need this for some of the upcoming lectures. But hey, if you've made it this far, thank you so much. Hope you're enjoying the lecture content. No matter where you are and what you're doing, make sure to always keep learning, keep dreaming, and to follow your heart. And you know what? I will see you later. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself.